Today is a brief tour of Sooner Random Number Generators in practice. And I have to apologize because um, this, even though this is a crypto school, this talk is not very cryptographic. It's mostly about <coughs> systems and how people actually implement cryptography. And that's sort of the reason why things are broken, is the systems reason, not necessarily the cryptography reason. So just a warning in advance, if you were hoping to see a lot of crypto, this talk is not it. A couple talks later, there will be more crypto. That, that's my warning. Okay, so I'm, I will start with this quote from von Neumann. Um, Anyone who considers arithmetical methods of producing random digits is, of course, in a state of sin. And this quote, I mean, what he was saying by this is that um, a deterministic method of generating randomness, which is what we need to use in cryptography, is not actually random. It's um, just by its definition, it's a deterministic method. And so you are buying yourself into a world of pain by doing this. But of course, this is what all of modern cryptography is based off of. So that's, that's a warning of what we're getting into here. Um, so I will start with the theory view. Hopefully you've all seen some kind of definition like this in your intro crypto class. At least I did, and I, I forced my core students this year to have definitions like this in their intro crypto class. So. Um, here we view we have a pseudorandom generator, it's a polynomial time deterministic function, g mapping n bit strings into L of n bit strings for some L of n is sort of greater than or equal to n, um, whose output distribution is computationally indistinguishable from the uniform distribution on L of n bit strings. Okay, there's a pseudorandom generator. Um, and so the, the picture that you might have of this is that in order to generate, say, long strings of pseudorandom, values in practice, we can take some environmental <coughs> entropy, we feed it into our pseudorandom generator algorithm, and we get out some value, which we then can then use to generate a crypto key. That's a nice picture. <coughs> that's, that's what we want. And you know, you can think, well, okay, there's, there's one problem, which is that this definition requires us to have uniform inputs, and the environment might not provide uniform inputs, but that's okay, because theory has the answer. Theory says that um, we can just have an extractor. And the, we just feed our entropy into an extractor. It will give us a nice uniform input. We feed that into our pseudorandom generator. And then we get out some crypto keys. All done. Right? Yeah. Good? Happy? OK. Well, OK. There's, there's a few problems. So I'll talk about sort of practical considerations in doing this. And then at the same time, talk, do some threat modeling. Um, problem number one, as I said, our inputs might not be random. Um, now, you can feed it through an extractor, but what if your inputs are really, really not random, like there's, there's no entropy to be extracted by your nice extractor? Well then, you know, if there's no entropy at all, you can test for that. So you can um, say, well, I don't know, are, are we getting any kind of different inputs at all? Basic test. The problem for that is that by the definition of a pseudorandom extractor, or a pseudorandom generator, this is impossible because there are distributions that um, have no entropy and um, which are computationally indistinguishable from, um, from a, a random distribution or distributions that have much less entropy than, than the outputs. Sorry, I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. Are we <laughs> with that grammatical enough to understand? Yes, okay. So it is. It is impossible by the definition of a pseudorandom generator to actually test for randomness. So we have, we have a little contradiction here. So in practice, what do you do about this? Well, you can do as well as you can. You can try to test for randomness. Um, now, this will break if our inputs are controlled by the attacker, because of course they can give us a distribution that we can't distinguish for, ran for random, but they can. And um, then, well, okay, you have to change your definition of what you're doing slightly and say, well, okay, maybe our, our attacker can't control all of the uh, inputs. We have to hope that we have some entropy coming from somewhere that actually has legitimate entropy that's not visible to the attacker that we don't understand that we can model, so that we actually get ent entropy from somewhere. So we can hope that we can define away this problem. Now, what does this actually look like if you try to build something? I've copied this diagram from the. Oh, this is being cut off. Can you see it? Oh, it's just slightly offset. I see. 
Um, okay, so I've copied this diagram from um, the NIST standard for what they call deterministic random bit generators, which is what they mean by pseudo random number generators. Um, now this is kind of a, a picture of um, a slightly more advanced version of what I had before. Um, so we have some entropy inputs here, and they're coming into an instantiation or resetting function, which feeds into an initial state, and then that state is fed into some generating function, so this would be our pseudo random generator from before, and that will give us some outputs. Um, so we have this, uh, we have our inputs, being filtered, they go into our state, and then we generate sequence outputs. We have some tests to try to at least make sure that this isn't completely broken, which will give us an error. Um, and there's some other things. But this is this is actually sort of the picture that you have in mind of, of what a practical random number generator, so your random number generator would look like. Now um, there are still some practical issues to, to worry about here. So one of them, which doesn't make any sense in theory, but in practice is very important, is what do you do if somebody requests output before you actually manage to see your random number generator? Uh, your options are you don't provide any output, or you wait to provide output until you actually get a seed fed in. That's one possibility. Um, the second is that you provide output anyway. <coughs> the third is that you raise an error flag and hope that whoever is requesting the output looks for the error flag and then deals with it in the proper way. The second question is how often do you receive? So you can receive every time you get a new input. You can receive after you have gotten, say, some number of inputs um, collected into a pool and then put them in <coughs> together. Or you can receive after you've requested, say, a certain number of blocks of output. And at least in the NIST standard, um, the correct answers here are um, if you request output before it is safe, um, you should raise an error flag and hope that whoever is, is requesting the output will deal with that properly. And then you should receive both after um, you have collected enough inputs um, or after you have requested um, a certain number of, of output blocks. So uh, there are two threat models going on here. One of them is that the reason that you might not want to receive on every new input is that if um, you were getting leaked in small amounts of entropy, the attacker might be able to brute force the small changes and um, you might hope that, or you, you don't want them to be able to do that. Um, so you accumulate, say, more than the, your attacker might be able to brute force and track the changes in your state um, in order to do that or in order to avoid uh, the attacker being able to track your state. And then um, you also want to recede after having output a certain number of blocks because you might be worried that the attacker, um, once they get a, a, a huge number of blocks of output from your sooner and generator, could um, then sort of work backwards and determine the inputs or the state that led to that those outputs. And then once they have the state, then they could, say, continue to get the output. Now, a third problem, which doesn't really come up in theory, but might come up in practice, is that your attacker might be influencing the design of your super and your um, So in the same document that I took this diagram from before um, is uh, the design, one of the uh, proposed um, deterministic random bit generators um, is the dual EC deterministic random bit generator, um, which, here's a little diagram of it. The specific details of how it works. There are some uh, pre-specified elliptic curve points, P and Q, on a fixed uh, curve. And the way it works, you have um, a C, which is a 32 byte integer S. Um, the C here, so it comes in here. Um, and then in order to update your state, you XOR your C with some possible extra inputs. Um, and then you generate your state by taking um, basically as a sort of inputs times um, your point P, you take the X coordinate of that and turn it to an integer and that's your state. Um, and so in order to um, 
refresh your state, you just repeat this over and over again. So you take S times your new S times P, X order to that, and you iterate that. So that is your um, state update function. And the output function is um, you have your state S, and you take S times Q, your second point, and that is, and you take the X order to that, and you discard the top two bytes, and then you output the 30 byte output. This is one of the proposed new random generators, random number generators in this thing. Hopefully you've all heard of this, and you know what I'm talking to you about. This. So um, there's a problem with this, which is that um, it might contain a backdoor. Um, this was presented by Dan Schumo and Niels Ferguson at the 2007 Crypto Run session. Um, so if an attacker happen to control the standardization process and they put in the standard two points P and Q that had a known relationship to the attacker but which was not known to the public because there needs to be a lot of problems with the curve points and assuming it would be hard, um, then they know this relationship. And if the attacker knows this relationship and they get enough outputs from this random number generator, then they can actually reverse engineer the state and then um, get all of the the, the future outputs of the random number generator. So the way this attack works is that the attacker gets 30 bytes of the X coordinate of SQ, so that's like, say, one of the outputs of this random number generator. Um, then they brute force the um, top two bytes of um, what S might have been. Um, so that's two to the 16 values. Um, and then they get at most two to the 17 possible Y coordinates for the elliptic curve point. And so they end up with, um, because of the way that the elliptic curve works, uh, two to the 15 possible candidate values for SQ. And then if they get another output of the um, of this random generator, then they can check um, whether it matched one of the candidate values for SQ. Um, and then they can just compare. Okay. So this is a 2 to the 17 work attack against this random number generator. Now this seems like, well, okay, this is, this is only theoretical, maybe, um, until um, some of the news last from a year ago. Um, this is, I don't think you read that. Um, this is a piece of a document which was published in the New York Times about an NSA program, um, which had among its goals to insert vulnerabilities into commercial encryption systems, IT systems networks, and endpoint communications devices used for <coughs> United States National Security Agency, um, and also to influence policy standards and specifications for commercial public key technologies. Now, this document did not necessarily mention um, this NIST standard or the um, dual ECDRPG, um, but the article claimed, based off of unnamed sources, but that that was one of the targets of this program. And at that point, I think all of us realized that we actually had maybe another adversary to worry about in the random number generation um, issue, which was not just that developers are not very good at implementing secure code, which I will spend a lot of time talking about for the rest of this talk, but actually that the people who are <coughs> supposed to be helping us make, or at least helping us Americans make nice secure standards, um, might not be the benevolent masters that we hoped that they might be. So um, there was actually a very interesting paper this year, um, which was at Eastern Security, um, which was by a very long, large number of authors, but um, some of them are Steve Chekoy, um, Matt Green, Tony Wanda, um, Tom Rayston Parks, um, uh, Dan Rosen, Kovac Chacon, and a bunch of their students, um, where they actually implemented this attack um, against some of the crypto libraries that contain implementations of the um, dual EC random number generator and looked at how difficult it was based off of the implementation to, um, to break the crypto. And the results is that depending on the implementation, it's either um, a tiny number of seconds, a medium number of seconds, or a not insignificant number of seconds. So there's some, there's some serious questions going on here what we as a crypto community can do about this problem. Um, 
course, it's not that nobody ever thought that this might come up before. So this is very much paper from the 90s, uh, young and Um, coming up with clever ideas of how to backdoor existing crypto systems. Um, it's, a, it's a very fun paper. Um, so they, they call this kleptography, so stealing cryptography. Um, and while this is very fun, it's a much harder problem than what I'm going to talk about for the rest of these lectures. Um, but this does raise one sort of open problem, which I don't know how to deal with, is that given well, so in, in this paper, we know how, I mean, they, they tell us how to design completely undetectable attacks against public key cryptography. Now, of course, this is not an undetectable attack because shortly after the standard was published, some completely independent researchers discovered it. Multiple people discovered this attack uh, independently. Uh, it's just you know, a fact about the, the way that this thing is, is constructed. Um, but it is possible to construct given that public key crypto exists, undetectable cryptographic attacks against cryptography. But um, is it possible to actually implement these things so that they are completely undetectable? So if, some, if we assume that the attackers are going to screw up the way that everybody else is implementing cryptography, is it possible to de detect this kind of thing in practice? And if it is, maybe you can use some of the techniques that I'm going to talk about to actually detect it. But right now, I don't know what to look for, so it's hard to tell. Open question, something to think about. So I'm not going to talk about cryptography for the rest of this talk. I'm pretty sure that all of the problems that I'm going to talk about are not actually backdoors. They're just failures in implementation. Okay. So now, all right. I just gave you one design for a random number generator. Um, there's a question in the computer. So if you're going to implement this thing, where do you put it? Um, this is a toy diagram of what a computer looks like. Um, I put these arrows for kind of, um, the arrows mean like get inf gets information from or is able to call. And in reality, like all of these arrows are actually like two ways. But we'll, we'll ignore that for a second, for a moment. So a computer looks something like you have some actual hardware. Um, the hardware, we've got some CPUs, we've got some storage devices, we've got some input devices. Those hardware pieces, well, um, there's an operating system which runs on top of the hardware. The operating system um, is able to get some information directly from the hardware. In some cases, it has to go through a device driver that um, interfaces with the hardware in order to get information on the hardware. Now, um, the operating system then running on top of the operating system is a series of applications. <coughs> and applications might be called common libraries um, that implement useful schemes. So, Here's our picture of a computer. Now, given this, where do we put a random number generator? Um, one answer is that we could put it in hardware. And then once it's in the hardware, then the operating system can make it available to any application that wants it. That is an easy answer. So here's a proposal for doing that. Um, this is in all of the um, Ivy Bridge and beyond Intel processors. Um, they implement a hardware random number generator, which can be called um, via a couple of um, instructions. So there's this um, RD RAND, or I think it's pronounced read RAND instruction. Uh, they also have a read seed instruction, uh, which they claim has extra good properties if you're just going to seed a <coughs> pseudo random number generator and continue on. I'll just talk about RD RAND. Um, so this looks this should look somewhat familiar based off of the sort of cartoon picture of the <coughs> random number generator that I've been talking about before. So we have a hardware entropy source here that provides, say, raw entropic outputs. We hope it has some amount of entropy. Um, now this then goes through some testing to make sure that our entropy source is good, it's not malfunctioning. Um, then uh, it is run through a randomness extractor, which tries to get uniform outputs. Um, then it is used to seed um, a, an actual um, pseudo random number generator. And then that output is actually output by this function. So this is the picture of what the um, Intel pseudo random number generator looks like. Um, I took this from um, the only actual technical information that we have about this in public, which is a report that was commissioned from cryptography research um, to 
study um, this random number generator. So they gave them extra access to, to things that we don't have in public. Okay. So some of the design choices that they made. Um, so the actual entropy source, it's a hardware entropy source. It's an oscillating circuit. Um, it's been too long since I took an EV class to actually understand this. Um, but the idea is that you have a circuit which is um, oscillating and it should have some chaotic interactions. And so the output should look random. Um, then the output of that, um, the extractor, what they call the conditioning um, function, is just iterating um, AES-128 with the fixed key. Um, their actual output function is um, AES-128 counter mode, so they get a um, seed and a counter location, and then they just um, output AES in counter mode of that. Um, now, based off of that, they reseed every 65536 bits of output, um, at least. And um, if the uh, randomness tests fail, so that they, they suspect that the uh, input, uh, the, the entropy source is, is malfunctioning, then they just um, uh, return all zeros, and then they clear the carry flag, which is their error flag. And so the caller of this function is required to check the carry flag and verify that it hasn't been set as an error condition before they actually use the output of this function. So there's the Intel Ivy Bridge kind of number generator. Um, well, this, is, this is great because um, we actually have a hardware source of entropy is probably pretty good. This is a sound design for a random number generator. Um, now, we have this problem that we had before, which is that what if an attacker is influencing the, the, the random number generator? We don't actually know what to do about that. Is, is the thing in the circuit actually the thing that's been published? Who knows? Um, now, even if the thing is in the, in the circuit is the thing that's been published, um, we might worry that an attacker could possibly control the hardware supply chain. Because if we're worried about other countries trying to backdoor crypto, then, um, well, if we're worried about certain countries that happen to produce all of the um, electronics and hardware that are done in the computer industry um, or other companies trying to influence who are actually doing the production, um, then you might worry that what goes into the design is not what comes out of the factory. Now there's a solution to this, which is that you audit the things that come out of the factory. You say, is the circuit design exactly what I sent in in my fabrication plans? Um, and you compare it to a known good design. Um, now, what if the attacker controls the hardware supply chain and you be clever? Um, so, if you want to be really scared, um, this is a paper that appeared at Chess last year. Um, and they pointed out that um, you could, well, it is possible to change the doping of the silicon and change the performance in gates in a way that is completely undetectable to somebody who is, say, using a microscope to examine the two circuits just visually. So the best thing that we know how to do is to say, um, just visually compare the two circuits, see that all the wires are in the same place, see that all the gates are, are the same. Um, but this is a way of, of getting around this, where um, the circuits will look exactly the same, they will perform the same in any kind of black box tests, uh, but um, they do not have the same performance uh, under all. And what they did, um, they had two examples, and one of them was changing the side channel resistance of a function, and the other one was showing how to um, undetectably trojan an AES um, circuit just like the um, Intel hybrid random number generator, um, so that it would output AES with just a fixed key that might say no to the attacker, and a 32-bit counter, which is enough to get around any reasonable randomness test, but um, could be easily checked by the attacker. That's scary, but that is beyond the uh, scope of the talk. Um, but this, this suggests that maybe just using a hardware random number source is not the solution to all of our problems if we are worried about these kinds of sophisticated adversaries. Um, so we have to do more work, which is that even if we have a hardware random number generator, um, maybe the operating system wants to do as well as it can. 
what does what do our options for implementation <coughs> in the operating system actually look like? Um, well, um, the one the example that I will talk about the most is Linux. Um, so Linux actually provides two random number generators. Um, they both have the same basis, but they have slightly different behavior when they get called. Um, so the way that they work, they heuristically measure the input entropy um, that they are getting. And they maintain a counter of how much entropy they think they have gotten. Um, and they collect entropy in an input pool, and the input pool is mixed into the output pool once the counter reaches um, a certain value of how much entropy they think they have. This is again to protect against the attack where for some, somehow an attacker has managed to compromise the state of a random number generator and is feeding in um, inputs slowly or can track the, the inputs that get fed in um, and then track the state as it changes. <coughs> protect against that, 192 bits is too much to brute force. Um, now they have their state mixing function is um, just basically a uh, a simple cyclic redundancy check type um, mixing function, so it's not cryptographically secure. Um, you're basically just evaluating a polynomial on the state and then updating it based off of that. And the output is cryptographically secure. Um, it's currently, I think, the SHA-1 hash of the state. So because SHA-1 is pre-image resistant, we shouldn't be able to discover the state from the output of the random number generator. Uh, but if we know the state, um, we might be able to go forward or backward to, to different states based on the input. Now, as I said, Linux provides two interfaces for um, actually accessing the random number generator. They have dead random, which tries to have a strong guarantee on um, this is not just pseudo-randomness, this is actual randomness. We are only going to provide as much output as we have measured um, entropy of the inputs. And we will just block um, and wait for additional inputs if, you, if the requester asks for more output than, than we actually had inputs. Um, then, because this is a little bit stronger than is needed from all sources, what if you don't actually require really strong outputs from your random number generator? Uh, they also provide an interface that never blocks. So, um, it will give you um, the continuously updating SHA-1 hash of the state and its, its refreshes for um, as many outputs as you want. And if you look at the NAND page, it says that the general rule of WRAN should be used for everything except modern GPGU size SSL size SSH keys. So that's what the NAND page says. So this is good for all of your everyday randomness needs, and this is good for your cryptographic needs. That was the intention in this design. Now, um, unfortunately, there are a lot of misconceptions from developers of what these guarantees actually mean. Um, so because of this sort of choice of, of implementations, it is really common that developers think that it is possible for Debbie Random to run out of entropy if it is called repeatedly. Um, and by running out of entropy, somehow, yes, okay, the idea is that um, if you request more output bits than you got in tropic inputs, then the only, that's the only the only amount of entropy is the entropy of the input information theoretically, um, and so therefore somehow if you request more than that, then you can run out of entropy, and somehow this magical attacker can reverse engineer your inputs and everything. Now, as cryptographers, we know this is silly because we have this idea of um, computational hardness of problems, and so even if you run out of entropy, you should never be able to to break this. But it is really common. That run out of entropy if you use that um, And the other misconception is that dev random, because it does this counting entropy, counting entropy thing, that that means that it's somehow information theoretically secure. Um, so dev random is too severe. It's basically designed to be an information theoretic random source, which means you could use its output as a one-time package <coughs> in the adversary where time traveling deities with countless universes full of quantum computers at their disposal. Which is a little bit uh, strong, also, because the entropy counting function is just a heuristic measure. And we are providing outputs that are, you know, a SHA-1 hash, which if you were all powerful, you could reverse engineer that anyway. So 
there's unfortunate misconceptions on both sides. But unfortunately, I mean, Bitcoin forum hackers, these are the people who are actually implementing applications in the real world. These are the people who actually need to use these interfaces correctly. So it's a little bit unfortunate that they don't, or that many of them don't understand the guarantees that are actually necessary for crypto in the world. <coughs> so here's a, um, another sample quote, um, which is from um, the developers of, this is an SSH um, server program. Um, and uh, what this is talking about is the choice of either blocking or not blocking. Um, blocking is actually a usability problem, so it's not, um, the intention of having this blocking behavior is that a developer would then say, oh, okay, I'm trying to generate a crypto key, I don't have enough entropy inputs to safely generate my crypto key, I should do it later, or I should provide more entropy inputs or something. But the way that this is actually um, interpreted by developers is that this is a gigantic pain. Because if you were trying to start up your computer, the first thing you were doing is starting your SSH server, and you're trying to generate a key, and you never get enough inputs, then, well, this is a problem. I don't know the difference between um, debian and dev random, as we saw before, is like the difference between information theoretically secure and computationally secure. I'm leaving my hands. <coughs> Therefore, there's no difference between these things in, in practice, and so we will just use debian random to generate all our keys, because this is fine. Uh, so if system developers aren't keeping seeds between boots, nor getting any entropy from somewhere, it's their own fault. This is someone who's writing a um, an SSH server. Okay. Um, now, there are some theoretical problems with the Linux random number generator design as well. Um, there's this very interesting paper we published at CCS in 2013, um, which had sort of two, um, two, I suppose, theoretical statements that they actually had um, kind of at least proof of concept um, attacks for. Um, one of them is that um, you can adversarially construct inputs to fool uh, different <coughs> entropy estimators. So you can give a sequence of inputs that has no entropy, um, that dev random thinks has a great amount of entropy. And you can also give a sequence of inputs that dev random thinks has no entropy at all. Um, is that what I just said? So you can give it no entropy and dev random will think that you have entropy, or you can give it lots of entropy and dev random will think that it has no entropy. So, um, this heuristic estimate does not say anything about adversarially constructed inputs. Um, and the second is that, um, as is actually <coughs> in the source code of the um, of the random, that this um, CRC-based state mixing function um, is not cryptographically secure. And so, among other things, it does not actually recover well from state compromise. So, if you think that your attacker might have compromised your state, and you hope that you have eventually even you've gotten a bunch of inputs since then. Um, and you hope you've recovered from your random number generation failure, um, you might not have. It might, you can provide a sequence of inputs so that um, the state, uh, that your new state does not actually have any entry, despite the fact that your inputs did. And this paper got a lot of attention on the internet, but the reaction from the Linux developers was that this is not a problem. This is not a real problem that we need to worry about. So I think an open question that this paper actually raises is, um, is it possible to produce an attack strong enough that it actually is a problem that the Linux developers need to worry about? Or is this just a theoretical issue? Okay. Um, now, uh, the um, Intel apparently spent a while asking Linux to just use um, their part of random number generator as um, dev random. We have this great random number generator. Um, it's much more secure than this terrible thing that you have implemented in software. You should just use it. Um, and um, Linux has basically said no. But they are willing to incorporate the output into um, the random number generator. Um, and right now they provide two, um, two functions. So you can call the um, read-ran instruction if you want from, from Linux, or you can, um, uh, 
or you can get the original interface that does not rely at all on reprint. Um, so there's a lot of politics going on here in, in how these things are being um, incorporated together and mixed, and this has been changing. Um, just recently, this past summer, um, the uh, Linux people um, announced that they were going to provide the interface that is actually cryptographically correct, um, which is that a pseudo-random number generator is fine. Um, what you actually want is something that acts like wrandom once it has been seeded, but will refuse to provide any output until it has been seeded. Um, and um, they will, um, they have this new um, get random system called that does this. And this is great, except that everybody is still going to use wrandom. And a lot of the problems that I'm going to talk about in the future um, in the next couple of talks are because people will continue to, because people were using that in Reddit and they will still continue. So, but I just wanted to put this in and say that Linux is actually doing the right thing eventually.
Um, it is not unreasonable to suppose that since uh, Niels Ferguson works for Microsoft, that perhaps um, more recent versions of Windows do something more <coughs>
responses on the open SSL dev mailing list are like, well, that's probably not a problem. Try to go ahead. So we did. This is from the maintainer of the Debian distribution of, open, of the open SSL package. Now what this turned into is that one of these lines, and in fact, this line, is the line that is actually adding entropy to the state of the random number generator. None of these other lines is actually doing anything. Um, and so what happened is that um, between 2006, when this guy commented on this line of code and it was distributed to every Debian user on the internet, um, and 2008, when this was actually discovered, so this went unnoticed for two years, um, the only source of entropy for the random number generator were um, with the process ID. And because these things were dependent slightly on um, whether you were a big Endian or a little Endian system, um, you also had some distinction from that. So, but in summary, basically there were um, 294,912 possible RSA keys that could have been generated by OpenSQL <coughs> in um, two years. Um, so I've taken this plot, um, a paper that was analyzing the scope of this problem um, after it was published. Um, and this plot is a plot of, they scanned the top million Alexa sites um, for TLS and looked at whether um, the public key in their certificate was actually, um, was secure or not, or was with one of these vulnerable keys. Because they could just enumerate all the possible keys that could be generated by any Debian system running OpenSSL um, for all the different key sizes. Um, and so when they started, this is a couple of days after it was, announced 1% um, of the internet was vulnerable, and then um, people sort of progressively, either their keys changed or they applied patches, and when they stopped uh, several months later, um, so in their days of the first measurement, 50% um, or half percent of the internet was still vulnerable. So this is one of the sort of major cryptographic disasters of the past 10 years. That, Debian basically had no entropy whatsoever, and nobody noticed for two years. And it was only noticed because uh, one developer actually noticed the repeated keys being generated on systems that he was testing. Okay. There's the state of our libraries. Um, now, what about putting um, random number generators into applications? Um, I think the at least for culture. Um, you all know about um, the most famous, uh, and probably the first publicly reported random number generation issue with um, SSL. Um, so this is from um, Netscape's, Net Netscape's implementation of SSL in 1996. They were using the process ID and the current time in seconds to seed the random number generator. Um, so all of the um, all of the crypto that was being done for SSL in 1996. Um, they knew the process ID and the parent process ID, um, and then they, they're seeing just an entry by patch of this, so it's completely deterministic. And then their uh, so you know, number generator was just in incrementing the seed and, and progressively outputting the MD5 patch of this. Um, now, the problem with this is that you can just brute force the number of microseconds since you think that this instance of Netscape might have been started and get all of their entropy outputs. And so that is what um, Ann Goldberg and David Wagner did in 1996. Um, this illustrates a sort of common pattern now in applications, which we also saw in OpenSSL, which is that an application, um, since reading things from the operating system is expensive, um, really what you want to do is see once from the operating system, assume your sooner and number generator is cryptographically, cryptographically secure, and then just continue outputting outputs from there and, and try not to update too often because it's kind of difficult. Um, now, a much more recent vulnerability that um, this is from last year. Um, this was discovered because a number of Bitcoin wallets had money stolen out of them. Um, and uh, it was eventually determined that uh, one of the causes of this vulnerability was that um, the Android Secure Random, um, the, um, the Android Secure Random 
function um, has a problem that it, it was not uh, fork safe. So that if a process, if you started one process and then you forked another process, um, then um, the random number generator state, because it was initialized once um, by the parent process, is just shared to the child process. And so the child process, um, the only new element that gets mixed in is a new process ID, um, which only has 2 to the 16 bits of entropy. And so it is much more uh, likely that if you are initializing a bunch of different child processes that you have um, some collision in your process ID and therefore get colliding values. And if you get colliding values, as I've explained in a couple of lectures, um, then Bitcoin has some really serious problems. So, um, this, this is just an illustration that this kind of application <coughs> security is really hard in the context of random number generators because you have to think about all these different things and all these different behaviors that the applications that are using your library might have um, that you don't even know about um, when you're developing your library. So a final issue, um, just as great as I should, I should mention, um, is virtualization. So um, if you have a virtual machine, um, what you have is um, this virtual machine running on top of an action. So you have a host operating system which is as an application running a, a virtual machine software, which has a hypervisor, and then you have this virtual operating system that is going through the hypervisor to interact with the actual physical computer. Now, in this case, a lot of the assumptions that your operating system might have about the hardware that it's interacting with might be incorrect because it's going through this extra filter. So um, there's an interesting paper by Tom Riston Hart and Scott Yelick um, from NDS in 2010, where they outlined the following problem with um, random number generators and virtual machines, um, which is that say you're um, a guest operating system running inside of a virtual machine, your user snapshots um, the guest operating system, so they take um, they, they take the state of the operating system at a particular time. This is useful because then you can replicate this, this operating system to many different users or instances using, say, <coughs> MC2, or say um, you want to, this is often done in security, you, you know that you have a good secure state then, and so you, you might do something dangerous and then revert to your known good secure state. Um, now, the problem with this is that if you initialize your random number generator at that known face snapshot state and then you return to it, then you have a sequence of repeated values in your random number generator, and this is bad. Um, here's an example of this happening in practice. This is a security advisory from DigitalOcean, um, which is a um, cloud hosting provider. Um, so the SSH host keys for some Ubuntu-based systems could have been duplicated by DigitalOcean snapshot and creation process. Therefore, our system is now configured to remove the host keys from <coughs> that are created from snapshots at the time of the first boot. So basically, the problem is that people were, were creating and configuring instances um, which already had their SSH host keys generated, and then if you say, oh, I, I would like to use this nice pre-configured um, instance of Ubuntu, then the SSH host keys were already generated. They wouldn't be regenerated, and so you would then have thousands of, of different machines on the internet, all with the same SSH host keys. This is a problem. So in summary, um, random number generation is hard. Um, it's a very hard problem in practice. People screw it up all the time. Um, and there's a bunch of practical constraints that um, developers that come up for developers and, and deploy systems that are not sort of part of the standard cryptographic model, um, such as performance, usability for developers, um, cross-platform software comp compatibility, if you need the same piece of software to run on uh, things varying from high-performance servers to mobile devices to embedded devices that all have these different kinds of constraints, um, and also that hardware is can be very diverse and very hard to audit. So that's all I have for today. Thank you.